we're lucky to have Kim. She also does the same thing and does in a different region of the Valley. So I'm going to introduce you to Kim Sherwood. Hello everyone. And thank you so much for being here. I want to take the opportunity to just thank uh, Daphne for inviting us to participate in these lunchtime educations. So if um, we have a fairly small group of people, if you have questions as I move along, feel free to ask them. I note that most of you are muted. So if you do have a question, don't forget to unmute your computer, uh, laptop, iPad, phone, whatever it is that you happen to be using right now. Um, just a little start. I've been with uh, Hospice of the Valley coming up on 10 years now and uh, love the organization. We do a lot to help our community. Um, and we're going to discuss today the differences between hospice care and palliative care and where they cross over, what the commonalities are and what the differences are, because there's a lot of questions that come up about that. So here we go. So this is from my perspective with Hospice of the Valley. We are a not-for-profit organization. So some of the things that we do may be different from hospices that are for-profit. There's, we, we have a lot of leeway because we are not for profit. So just you know keep that in mind. Uh, most of the main things will remain the same across any of the hospices in the Valley though. So with that, I'm gonna get started. What we're gonna discuss today and what we're gonna hopefully learn about is um, what is supportive care? So we changed the name uh, in our own organization from palliative care supportive care. And the reason for that is there's a lot of confusion in the community about what the differences are when we use the word palliative. So palliative basically just means to reduce symptoms. But as you can see, that kind of crosses over both. And in the community, as soon as a physician or somebody says palliative, most people's minds go directly to hospice. And they are two separate things. So we have changed our palliative care program's name to supportive care, because that's what it is. We're here to support you guys, and it is separate from hospice. So two separate things. So when I say supportive care, just know that that's what I'm referring to. I'm referring to palliative care. Plus, it's a harder word to say, right? So <laughs> that's what we're going to go with today. All right, so we're gonna discuss what supportive care is, what hospice care is, what services are provided under each, um, who pays for these programs, um, and who chooses your, your hospice provider. So that's kind of the overview of what we'll be doing today. So the main difference between supportive care and hospice are what your individual care goals are. It's basically um, supportive care you could think of as still seeking curative treatments, um, life-sustaining, life-prolonging treatments. Hospice is more comfort care. We're no longer seeking aggressive treatments and we're gonna let nature take it. Those are the main two differences. So again, the decision between palliative care and or supportive care and hospice is basically what your goals of care are. And they can change, right? They can go back and forth. So that's the number one thing. So with palliative care, it's usually for people who have uh, a, a terminal disease. It could be at the beginning of the terminal disease or all the way through um, up till hospice care that you could take, take advantage of palliative care. Um, most people do end up uh, coming on to some kind of supportive care program, usually when they're at the later stages of a chronic disease, because usually you've been managing okay up until you know, things start getting a little tricky. It's harder to get out of, out of home or, you know, there's more symptoms. Um, so it's just a natural thing that most 
patients and families sign on to our on any supportive care program at the later stages of a terminal disease. So the other time, the other big difference is that you can get supportive care while still getting aggressive life-sustaining treatments. To give you an example, um, let's say cancer. Uh, let's say you've got uh, stomach cancer. You're getting, you're going to an oncologist. You're probably going to a, a GI doctor. You're still seeing your PCP. We support you through all of those. You may also be going to and uh, um, getting chemo treatments, radiation treatments through your um, specialists. So we help support you while you're still on this curative journey. And that's part of the supportive care slash palliative care program. So you can continue to get those um, life extending, life prolonging treatments while on the supportive care program. And you'll receive them until your, your goals are met. Um, you may transition maybe to our phone support if there's nothing else. You know, we've got all the resources in place for you. Things are going okay. We'll step out and probably back you down to our phone support program. So we have lots of different levels, several different levels of supportive care available to the community. Could be just as little as touch points through our phone support you know, once a month, it could be more frequent. Um, and then more frequent visits through a social worker. Our supportive care programs, um, generally speaking, if they are not paid for by your insurance company, um, it's a social worker model. So we come in, we make sure that you're getting to all the appointments that you need to get to, that you understand the disease process, um, if there's needs for certain equipment in your home, then we can point you in the direction um, of other resources in terms of being able to get that equipment in or how to ask your PCP for it. If it's not covered by insurance, we have our thrift shops and a lot of times our social worker is able to get people medical equipment for free that way. So there's lots of resources within the community that we can pull in to assist you. And through any of our supportive care programs, you always have uh, the ability to contact someone 24 seven. And it's not an answering machine. It's not an after hours service. You're speaking directly to an on duty staff member at Hospice of the Valley, regardless of what program that you're on, to help those help help you work through what those events are, um, what's happening in your house. Is it behaviors from someone who's got um, dementia? Is it you know nausea due to a chemo treatment? Um, there's tips and tricks that we have that we can call in, or we can advise you. Yeah, you know, I think you should go to the emergency room um, and get assistance that way too. But you will always have someone to contact 24/7, including holidays and they are on duty. So that's a great relief for people simply because nothing ever happens nine to five, Monday to Friday, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything's always good during those hours, but you know, symptoms always seem to come up at about two in the morning on mm -hmm. a Sunday. So uh, we, we need to be there to be able to help out uh, the community. So those are those, those things. Um, and if on palliative care, if you do have a supportive care, a, a terminal diagnosis, which for the most part you will, terminal diagnosis just means, or terminal disease would be something like, you know, a stomach cancer that's, pro, um, oh my gosh, that has progressed. <laughs> I'm getting about three words mixed up in that one that has progressed um, beyond or, or will progress beyond the ability to be treated. Um, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is another one that is going to have, uh, you know, a, a terminal end to it. So those are things that I'm talking about. Pancreatic cancer is another one. Um, so that's just kind of what I mean there. All right. So that's the basic category for our supportive care. Um, 
I did mention very briefly that there are programs out there that are covered through your insurance. Um, and we do partner with those under our Arizona Supportive Care Program. So palliative care, supportive care can be um, insurance-based where the insurance company pays for your support. And if not, again, we are a not-for-profit, um, we'll cover the, the cost of the care. So that's that. We're gonna transition into hospice now. And then I'm gonna delineate where there's commonalities between both. So now with hospice, um, hospice is really just a philosophy of care. That's all it is. And it's just about, instead of going to continue with treatments that are no longer effective, um, you're deciding to spend time with family and you know, relax, and say, conserve energy and spend it doing things that you wanna do versus trying to get to one doctor's office and the specialist and treatments, et cetera, which can be very debilitating for somebody who is fighting um, a terminal diagnosis. And it's completely up to you, but it's just, hospice is just basically there as Comfort care, we're gonna let the disease state run its normal natural process till its end. We're not going to do any aggressive or heroic um, life extending treatments. So um, that's basically it. We wrap people, a community of people around the patient and their family in order to support everyone, because really it's not just about the patient, it's almost more about the family members that are around them. There's a lot of stress, there's a lot of time that's dedicated to looking after them, and we want to make sure that everyone is doing okay and that they're getting the support that they need and understand what's happening. So with that, there's um, when you're on hospice services, you can have a chaplain, you can have a volunteer, you get um, a CNA or a certified nursing assistant to help with things like bathing. You have an assigned nurse case manager and you also have a physician and the physician can be your community, community physician or it can be a hospice physician with whichever hospice that you're with. Medicare guidelines, uh, which were established back in the 80s, I think it was 1986, Medicare started paying for this hospice benefit back then. So there's no cost to Medicare, or I'm sorry, to hospice services. However, what happens if you're not of Medicare age? Mm. A lot of people um, get their coverage through their regular insurance companies. So that's available to most, not all. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also people that just don't have any kind of insurance coverage and yet are faced with a terminal diagnosis. So again, regardless of anyone's ability to pay, we are able to step in and assist the whole family with hospice care. So Medicare, through your Medicare Part A is what pays for uh, hospice services. And again, because hospice is a philosophy, it is not a place. So we look after you wherever you consider home. That can be an individual home. It could be under the Seventh Street Bridge. It could be in an assisted living. It could be in a skilled nursing facility. Um, it could be in a memory care unit. So we kind of come into your home on individual visits, and we help to supplement uh, what's happening in all those different places, whatever care you're receiving in those places. Um, one of the big things that we encounter a lot out in the community is that they think if someone signs on to hospice, that again, we're gonna take you somewhere and look after you, or that somebody's gonna come in and be with you for you know 24 seven. That is not the case. Um, we are there to help make sure that symptoms 
are under control, that you have the right medications, that we would adjust the medications if needed. We do provide that CNA um, in a couple times a week as needed or not if you don't want to. Um, again, same with chaplain, social worker, nurse. You know, these are people that are coming in and out of your home to assess your needs, but we're not there 24 seven. So you would still need to um, uh, look after your loved one wherever they are uh, in regards to those details. So with hospice services, again, you're no longer getting kind of the curative treatment and you're not gonna be wanting to go to the hospital anymore for the same reasons that you're not, you know, going to the PCP or the specialists. You know, you're wanting to just let that disease progress naturally. So no more chemo, no more radiation, no more uh, dialysis of any kind. These are all barriers to hospice services and they are put in place by Medicare. These are rules that we have to follow. The other rule is that in order for someone to be on hospice, they have to have a prognosis from two different physicians that they think someone has about six months or less to live if, um, if it was to progress as the majority of people tend to progress. No one has a crystal ball. A lot of people end up on hospice for longer. A lot of them can be shorter. It just, you know, no, no one knows when your end date is and we don't do anything to change that. <laughs> so it is, it is what it is. Um, now with hospice services, in addition to all the people that I mentioned, we also provide a lot of the DME or the equipment. So if you need a hospital bed, we'll provide the hospital bed. If you need a bedpan, we provide that. Um, oxygen, we'll provide oxygen. We provide all the medications that are related to the hospital to the hospice diagnosis. This is um, kind of another thing that that comes up. Let's say you have someone who is on hospice for, let's say, uh, COPD. Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And I don't know, they've been getting eye drops for uh, something that prevents blindness. Let's say, I'm just trying to think of something that's like kind of totally different. Um, we do not make you stop those eye drops uh, because they're outside that terminal diagnosis. Those trips, those visits, if you wanted to continue to go to see your ophthalmologist to get those treatments, you could still go to get them and they would be billed through your insurance as normal. Same with any of those medications that are related uh, to what's going on with the vision. So those can continue. It's a lot of the other ancillary medications like blood pressure medications, cholesterol medications that we would discuss continue because they're not, you know, going to extend your life. You're already on a path where you've got a terminal end and blood pressure meds aren't going to change anything. Cholesterol meds aren't going to change anything. So we simplify the medications that way. And honestly, most people end up <laughs> because of it. They're not on so many medications and, um, it just tends to help the body. And it is amazing for a lot of the people that end up on hospice because they're not going to and from all these uh, offices, they tend to do better, you know, and we're in the home, we're providing medications to them. They're getting the attention they need when they need it. Um, we can send nurses out, you know, at three in the morning, we can change medications and get medications delivered at three in the morning, that kind of thing. People do better. And it's not unusual for people to stabilize and, you know, discharge off hospice services. Mm -hmm. So it can be a fluid thing. Uh, also, if you suddenly hear that there's some new treatment out there for whatever you've got and you decide, well, you know, I want to give that a go, you can sign off hospice and go do those treatments. So it's not set in stone. Um, but I think most people find that 
you know, they, they really come to rely on and enjoy the fact that they've got that support and that big safety net to, to assist them. So um, providers, what about my doctor? Like we get a lot of questions about um, people, they've seen their PCP, their primary care provider for years and years and years, and they wanna to continue to see that person even when they're on hospice services. We do encourage uh, our community providers to collaborate with us so they can continue to serve the patient's needs. Having said that, the majority of the physicians in our community uh, turn that over to us because they're not specialized in that hospice uh, care. So we let that we let them decide what they want to do, and we let you as a family decide what you want to do as well. So as long as both are on board, you want them to participate, and they're okay participating. We are, you know, very happy to partner with them uh, to care for you and get orders. So that's actually one of the commonalities uh, between hospice and palliative care, which is what I'm going to get to. So the main um, focus of both supportive care and hospice care is to provide comfort and to relieve suffering as much as possible. We are also there to address physical discomfort, social, psychological, spiritual uh, needs for both programs. And really we're there to support the needs of the family. So it's just a matter of, again, that main question, what are your goals of care? Uh, are you looking to continue to seek treatment? Great, we're happy to support you under our supportive care programs to get the most out of that treatment. Um, if you need more support and you're ready for hospice, great, we can move you on to hospice and get more support. You'll stop treatment, you stop going to the hospital, um, and we would come to you and address any critical needs. So again, um, there's differences, but the main difference is what are your goals of care? The main commonalities are basically we're there to assist as much or as little as needed. And it's up to you as a family to decide. And it's very fluid, just as the disease progresses and plateaus and gets better or, or not, you can come up up and on and off as needed. Nothing is set in stone. So with that, what questions do you have for me, if any? I don't know if there were any questions in the chat. Richard, I see you. What is your question? Um, yeah, I have a little bit of confusion as far as the palliative care. Yeah. Um, I have a family member when she had her last Medicare physical, our family physician did a palliative care referral. And we had an agency contact us and refer us to Hospice of the Valley. And after discussing with them what my needs were, which are primarily having somebody that can look after her when I need to take care of my own medical needs uh, and maybe do some, some um, uh, grocery shopping and so forth. So they told me that I and actually referred me to the supportive care uh, side of it. And I was contacted by them and I told them the same thing that I need. And she told me that uh, you don't do that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> all, you do we, is, all you do is education. Yes. So we provide support in the home but we don't provide custodial care. And that's what you're looking for. So under any of our programs, we do not have somebody that comes um, and just sits there so that you can go and do other things. That's more a home health, a non-medical home health agency that would provide that custodial care. So whether it's hospice services, Remember when I was saying, you know, some right. people think that we take them somewhere and look after them 24 seven, or that we have someone come to your home and look after them 24 seven. We don't do that. We're in and out of your home every couple of hours to see, you know, to assess, make sure things are going on 
that are okay. Now, having said that, we do have volunteers under hospice that we may be able to set you up with where the volunteer is willing to come out and take you to go shopping or sit with your loved one for a couple of hours while you go do whatever it is that you do. But it's not, it wouldn't be something that would happen, you know, four hours every day. It would be maybe, you know, one day, you know, whatever the volunteer schedule allows. So it's not something that's normally uh, done. Yeah, I wouldn't be looking for every day. This would be periodic when I would have a situation where I need a couple hours to do my own doctor appointment or something. And right. So that's a, so it would be strictly on a volunteer basis. Under our hospice. Under the hospice yeah, side. not under our supportive care under hospice. So now I there's also be... resources that are available through Benavia as well, mm -hmm. where they may be able to assist you with that. So definitely contact Benavia because they have those resources mm -hmm. to put you into, you know, they either have their own volunteers or they can put you in touch with home health agencies as we would as well. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? That's a great question. Thank you, Richard. Any other questions? Okay. I don't think we've got any more coming in. Okay, I'll ask. Oh, yes, Gail. Uh, so is supportive care the same as supportive care for dementia? In a way, yes. <laughs> Um, okay. it's a separate program with hospice okay. in the Valley and okay. yeah, but it is exactly that it's, it's to help assist family members anywhere from initial diagnosis okay. till hospice. Okay. But it's a specialized program for those with dementia. Okay. Just so much more that's involved with, with, uh, patients and families that are dealing with dementia, but the okay. same basic premise mm -hmm. is there. We okay. Do that support 24 hour assistance and it is okay. completely free of charge. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question, Gail. Yeah. Any other questions? Give it a few more seconds, see what happens. If you have questions, don't forget to unmute your line. I think we might be good. Well, thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm gonna turn this back over here, um, but just really appreciate it. If you have any questions at all, um, don't hesitate to reach out to Benavia or to Hospice of the Valley. We'd be happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you need any information related to how to get in touch with Hospice of the Valley, feel free to reach out to us at Benavia. Um, we can give you um, the contact information for them. Um, also, once again, for those of you who came on later, if you are struggling and need more than, um, than hospice can provide, if you're actually trying to place a loved one in a facility, um, or need a day program so you can have respite at home for someone with dementia or um, Parkinson's disease, call Benavia also to find out about that or if you need referrals to some home health care agencies um, because of your particular situation or even just assisted living for yourself. You know, there's just a lot of things we can point you in the right direction because um, we're connected with a lot of um, social service agencies. So like hospice. So thank you so much and um, good luck on your journeys. You are not alone and um, we, we uh, are thinking of you. So take care and have a very happy new year. Bye. <laughs>